Uh, kia ora tarou. Just checking. So what I wanted to talk to you uh, today was around the, the economic benefits of resilient pasture. And really, that covered an, an analysis across um, three key areas, if you like. The first was the cost of growing pasture. The second was a uh, sort of cost-benefit analysis, if you like, uh, looking at what were the, the, um, the benefits of, of increasing the area regrassed on a representative uh, farm. And then looked at the multiplier effect of that on the wider economy um, and the benefits that, that flow from that. So the first up really was looking at the cost of growing pasture, and there's two aspects to this. The first is really the direct costs of, of, of maintaining and, and the, the, the pasture in a healthy state and all the rest of it. Um, as you can see uh, on the screen there, <coughs> Got fertilizer, regrassing, weed and pest. Topping, we included that, well, I included that in the sense that a lot of farmers, particularly dairy farmers, use topping as a means of maintaining pasture quality. And irrigation is also a direct cost. Now, it's not involved in this uh, uh, example, but if, if you're irrigating uh, your pastures, then obviously you will have some direct costs of doing that. Now, if you're growing pasture, um, usually you use a medium to grow it in, and, and most of us choose to grow it in dirt, okay? Now, the issue we have in New Zealand is our dirt costs a lot of money. Very expensive. Um, so there's some opportunity cost of that, and there's a cost of maintaining that dirt, um, you know, to keep the, the system trucking. And then there's the managerial input, because how you manage your pastures directly influences uh, how well they grow and, and how much of that you uh, utilise. So if you like... What I've done is, is looked at both those direct and, and indirect costs and, and worked them through. Now, the first one was on a representative Waikato Bay of Pindy Dairy Farm. This is the, the, the model that we've monitored now for over 30 years. It's based on the average property um, across those two regions. Now, it grows about 14 tonnes of, of dry matter, and we eat about 11 and a half tonnes of that. So <coughs> I'm working on an 84% utilisation, and it's the, it's the grass eaten that those costs refer to. So as you can see uh, there, your direct costs around three cents per kilo of dry matter, and then you've got a range of, of indirect costs. And the obvious thing there is, uh, or the big cost, if you like, is that opportunity to cost the land. Sort of substantially uh, adds to the scheme of things. Now I did the same uh, uh, exercise, if you like, on uh, a representative North Island Hill Country Sheep and Beef Farm. Again, it's the... Uh, an average model for that area, which we've monitored for a long time. Interesting, well, coincidentally, I'd have to say I was quite interested, the direct costs came out exactly the same. Um, your total costs there, 15 cents versus 26 for the dairy. The main aspect there is that opportunity to cost the land again, and obviously the, the cost of the hill country, um, or the value of hill country lands is much less. Now, in saying that, two things. One, as I mentioned before, the cost of irrigation is not built into the Waikato model because we have very little irrigation. If you did, you'd probably add another one or two cents to it. And the other aspect for the hill country property, with the opportunity cost of land, since I've done this, um, courtesy of carbon farming, the value of hill country land has gone up, so the opportunity cost has also gone up. So the next step was to look, as I say, at the cost benefit of increasing the area regrassed each year. So I've used our, our uh, Waikato um, uh, model to do that. And analysing the data over the last few years, on average they've, they've uh, regrassed around 8% of the, of the farm each year. So I said, OK, what what's the cost and benefits, if you like, if we lift that up to uh, 15%? Now, within the analysis, and you can read the, all this in the paper, if you like, there's plenty of assumptions which underlie all this. Obviously, the first assumption is jumping from 8% to 15%. Um, the assumptions there around the increase in dry matter uh, from, from the uh, regrassing, um, a slight increase in ME per kilo. Uh, if you're regrassing 15% of the farm per year, that means you've got an eight-year cycle. So I've developed as a, a de decay curve, if you like, in terms of, of the value of that pasture uh, as it... As it um, decays over the eight, eight years, <coughs> and follow all that through. So what I did was build all that up into a Farmax model and compared the, um, the, the base farm versus the regrass farm, if you like, 
And yeah, as you can see there, so my EBITDA uh, increased by uh, 6%, um, and the physical parameters there around 2%. Now, just coming back, so in terms of the EBITDA, the difference was 137 bucks per hectare. As I say, that's in year one, and that slowly dec decays away to next to nothing over the eight-year period. So I then plugged that into a, uh, a cost-benefit uh, uh, matrix, if you like, um, to come up with some interesting sort of figures there. <coughs> so what I've done is I've assumed, I've, well, I've varied the assumption, if you, if you like, around the, the percent of that extra pasture that's consumed. So the 84% is the, is the base, that's our, our current utilisation rate on our, on our, our farm. Um, so I said, what if we, if we only get 75%, half of that, or a quarter of that? As you can see, the, um, the MPVs and the IRs came out um, reasonably healthy, I thought. Um, much better than I thought. The NPV discounted, the cost of capital I used was 5%, which is the current government discount rate. The next step was to look at the multiplier effect of that. So there's, there's, there's a huge assumption here, ladies and gentlemen, in the sense that what I've assumed is the benefit that I've shown on my model farm is now repli replicated across every dairy farm in the Waikato and Bay of Plenty. So you just sort of keep that in the back of your minds. Now the multiplier effect, if you like, is um, um, the, the, the impact through the economy of, of an increased um, uh, economic activity or spend. So if I increase my economic activity, I'm making more money, so I then spend that on more goods and services. So that's the direct effect. So the, the, the firms and whatnot that I'm buying those goods and services from then increase their spend, so that's the indirect effect. And then the firms that they're spending their money on also increase their act, uh, economic activity, and that's the induced effect. So that's the employment impact there, as you can see. And that's the value add impact across, um, as I say, across the Waikato Bay of Plenty. Um, and I can't remember the, the, the relative impact of the employment, but certainly in terms of that value add, the total 136 million, that's about 4% of the agricultural component of, the, of those regional GDPs, and it's about 0.2% of the total GDP of those two uh, regions. So. Um, you can debate how significant that is, but um, it's certainly an a, a increase. Yeah, and that's it. That's me.